Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I probably couldn't have asked for a better speaker to follow than Chris because a, a tremendous amount of what Chris believes uh, is the core of how we operate every day. And I want to just start a couple of different ways with this. There's a, uh, I could have started by saying now word from your sponsor because part of the reason I'm up here at this session is we're one of the sponsors of this event. And it's incredibly important to us that events like this take place. And then the other thing, just talking to colleagues at this, uh, at the event, I want to give you a, a little perspective of what it's like uh, being responsible or given the stewardship of a company that's 170 years old, okay, that could start this year and the next decade, never sell anything and still be profitable. Not competitive, not sustainable, but profitable. So I'm guessing compared to where a lot of you are sitting today in your businesses and where you are, that's probably a slightly different equation, okay, and a slightly different look at the world. So let me give you just a little idea in the next few minutes what we spend time on, what we spend energy on. Um, we're well aware of Chris's comment that 95% of innovation in corporate, uh, the corporate world fails, okay? But we start with a couple of assets, and then we start with challenges that you probably have at the same time. So we have an iconic brand. The expression comes from the Byzantine era. It was to put a face on virtue, typically saints on the sides of buildings. Again, this goes back to when literacy was at a different level. But it was an attempt to teach people behaviors and to, to Chris's point, to put a face on values that socially we agreed on. So when you get to work in my role and the team that, that we've got gets to manage a firm like ours, you actually inherit the trust of 170 years worth of other people's work, okay? Now that's a currency, and it's one to be treasured and guarded and is absolutely critical. So the decisions you make have to be through that lens. They have to be through the, will it, will it be better when you're done? Are you doing things that disrupt the values that got the company where it is? Because the idea that Prudential's role is we're gonna solve people's problems, we're gonna de-risk their lives, if that's they're worried about the birth of a child, if they're gonna run out of money in retirement, they're not gonna be able to pay their medical bills, what happens if the breadwinner dies in the family? These are emotional issues. And some of your technology and some of our clients, 26 plus million clients, is where the solutions lie. So when we get together, we just did this, our top 100 people, we bring in people on experts on demographics, people on medicine, people on data models. And I want to give you just a little bit of insight of the kinds of things we look at in our, in our away days, our weekend strategy, sort of multi-day strategy meetings. And they're probably not dissimilar to where you see opportunity with your business, okay? Our goal in those sessions is, again, with our time frame and our financial strength, we look out about a decade in our strategic planning. Okay, what's going to change with our consumer set in the next 10 years, and what do we need to look like 10 years from now to have another 170 years? Okay, so in our world, demographics is destiny. This is a demographic wave you're looking at. Sometime next year, depending on the researcher you ask, sometime last year, the number of workers to retirees turned over. Okay, so what does that mean? more people are in retirement than are working for the first time in 50 years. Now, if you're retired, okay, who's gonna pay for those benefits? If you're working, how many people do I have to sustain? If you're a government policymaker, these people in retirement are living longer, healthier, and some of the other innovations are changing the quality of that lifestyle, and we need policies to address that. We used to look at, so we have 660,000 agents that represent us in Asia alone. We have 25,000 uh, bank branches that distribute. So we think we're pretty good at getting local. But if you were at one of our meetings and we said, where are we going to open up next? Or where are we going to deploy resources 10 years ago, that same meeting? We'd have said, well, you know, we're probably safer waiting for some establishment of banks in a location, some establishment of hospitals in a region, so we can provide our services with an ecosystem that makes sense. That's no longer true, okay? This is uh, one of Jimmy Wales. He was with us, the founder of Wikipedia. These are the top 10 new languages on Wikipedia. Everybody speak all 10? One person in the back. Congratulations. That's amazing. Um, 
What's the takeaway? Well, the information age, the idea that you now have an information middle class. There's lots of people here who are more versed than I am on the demographics on the web, on how many billions of people now have access to information they never had. Some of these are translation sites. You can tell by the, the uh, statistics there. Some of them are actual real sites. But these consumers now simply need connectivity. But more importantly for our businesses, they come with an expectation it'll be on their terms. It'll be in their languages, right? It'll be in a space that they choose. So our choice is to rather miss them as clients or lose them as clients or adapt our models, including the face of the company. Do we have people that they can interact with that understand these cultures and languages? Because it's not typically just a language issue. We looked at medicine. This is probably, to me, um, one of the most interesting uh, of all the stuff going on in AI. I mean, OK, AI. So the idea of large mathematical models calculating outcomes. Okay, that's innovative in a conference like this. To a bunch of actuaries, it's basically a faster slide rule. We've been doing demographic models. We've been doing actuarial tables since there was an industry. What's changed is the tools. Okay, if we were here 1990, okay, you would have had 50 people that were 100 years old in Singapore. You have 1,000 now. You also, by the way, would be celebrating at this conference the creation of the web. And one or two of you would know that someone was working on a device called the Palm Pilot that might be out in a few years, just to give you an idea of the, the mental context of when that was. Okay? But all of a sudden, postpone and prevent illness is a real issue. This is a study. It's amazing. Michigan State did this. Great database. Again, the... The, the, the sort of data engines you would expect to run the calculations, and it's a predictor of height. Now, again, if we were here in 1990, science had known for about 10 years how to deal with single genetic disruption illnesses, okay, single mutation illnesses. But most illnesses are multiple dynamics to them. So this model is multiple. Now, you would think at my size, I chose height for a reason. Um, I didn't. I would be somewhere on that far corner. And as my wife pointed out, the, the, uh, the sample base here was scientists from uh, an NHS property of all their genomes. So this is actually the, the height of thousands of scientists. You'll notice no one's my height that's a scientist, which my wife was the first to, uh, to point out. So that apparently wasn't a career choice. But What's this matter to us? Well, what if the health proposition with our clients is we can help them live longer? What if we go from ensuring medical risk to helping a consumer's longevity? It's a different proposition. All right, how does it look in practice? Okay, one, on the, ready for 100. Our Singapore team here did a project in Singapore. They asked, they told people, there's 1,000 of your neighbors that have lived to be 100. Are you ready? What's your lifestyle look like at 100? There's financial considerations. There's medical considerations. There's social considerations. One of Chris's comments, one of the key elements with people post-retirement is their emotional well-being, not financial. Are they living alone? What's their connectivity with society? Who do they talk to? How do they get their news? All right? Those sorts of dynamics. So when we meet here in Singapore with healthcare providers and the government and, and in-home hospital care and in-home tech care, outpatient support, there's emotional support. These are all elements of how you're going to live with a population that 26% of thinks they're ready to live to be 100. It also needs new product and innovation. On the portfolio side, on assets, on financials, how are you going to fund that? Well, one. As an employer, we, let, we abolished a, a working age, 62 retirement age. Some very bright people in the world are above 62 years old. Okay, so that's one. On the product side, on the, on the accumulation of wealth side, the technology we're bringing now is active asset management with artificial intelligence engines for asset allocation and deployment. Okay, on the on the medical side, and that's an accumulation product system and a decumulation. How do you make that money last for that period of time? 
On the health side, far left, Babylon. We're bringing Babylon's technology to 12 countries in Asia. It's an artificial intelligence diagnostic and preventative tool on your phone. Okay, should you make, now, you know, you hear in these conferences, and Chris mentioned it, the non-banked. Non-bank consumers are also often non-health protected consumers. It's often a, a material disruption in their lives to seek medical care, not just the cost. It may be hours away. So what if you have an app on your phone that can say, all right, let me ans let's answer some questions in the privacy of your home. Maybe you should go see a doctor, triage. Okay, be one of the single best benefits of it. We're taking that to 12 countries. Far right hand side, the cow, was supposed to look like a cow. That's from Ghana. So in Ghana, one of our newer markets, it, when you die, you'd like to be buried in something that was important to you in your lifetime. So if you're a golfer, it's a golf bag. If you're a fisherman, it's a fish, okay? They're very interesting. It's also a very important time in the family's life to transfer power in the family, and it's expensive on a relative basis, okay? So we, we took with a local mobile carrier. We have our bank distribution there, an agency, but we also produce for non-banked clients the ability to pay for that with mobile minutes. We have 1.6 million clients that their only interaction with us is mobile pay and mobile minutes, not mobile money. All right, finally, you're dealing with an insurance company. As a vendor, as a consumer, as a regulator, we love to build everything end to end. If you want to use a water analogy too much here, I'm going to come back to it. We, we're aircraft carriers, okay? I can tell you, so when I, one of my first uh, presentations to our board 23 years ago in Hoburn Barnes, I brought an IBM laptop that could actually had an embedded digital card. It was amazing, okay? And I needed to connect to the boardroom. They wouldn't allow me to bring an outside cable. Our facilities and IT people built a multi-pin printer cable to connect to my computer. Okay, it looked like a fire hose. By the time they were done with it, they built it overnight. Got to give them credit for that, right? Little props to those of you that work in hardware. Okay, and that's how proprietary our industry is. Okay, there is no possible way. Oh, 1930, when somebody pointed out to me earlier to, uh, today, we owned our own film studio in London. And the reason we owned a film studio is so we could produce in-house training films because we didn't think anybody externally should see the content because you know how valuable insurance training films are to you know, foreign governments and things. That's us. Again, you evolve, you change. This is more what we look like now. So I love to dive. If, you haven't, if you're visiting this area and you haven't been in the water here, it is absolutely spectacular. Some of the most beautiful spots in the world are an easy, an easy hour from here. A reef is a perfect analogy for what we have to be. Okay, we have to be something different. We have to be a part of what's going on around us. We have to be dependent and connected to things going on around us. So if you look at our Singapore office, this, we opened up in 1924 here. Okay, that business partners with technology partners like IBM, not surprising, right, at our size, we'd be with a big company. They did our chatbots and technology and BlackRock did the Aladdin platform for the asset managers. Smaller firms on our SME platforms that provide finance, medical, legal support to other small businesses, they were designed by four fintech firms from here, okay? Their innovation, our brand, right? Our data, our distribution. It's a great partnership. Okay, I could go through dozens of these. The MAS that referenced earlier, Singapore is an environment where you have the government looking at solutions holistically, okay, and you have the MAS, a regulator, actually having an interest in the technology expanding in our space is unique. So we can try our best and newest ideas here and do, and, and that combination produces a unique outcome. So I guess what I'd say to you is this, our challenges are probably no different than yours. Um, it is about how do we get to people uh, on their terms. In a lot of ways for us, tech is a prerequisite. If a consumer in China wants to pay with you know, Alipay or WeChat, that's not our decision. 
Okay, that's the consumer's decision. Our decision: Are we going to be successful in that market or not? So we have to adapt. Okay, our core businesses of de-risking people's lives, de-risking things they care about, hasn't changed any. And somewhere in this room, okay, if we're going to collectively as a society, if we're going to collectively care about, about what comes next, we're going to need solutions that take care of a much larger part of the population with much more information, who's going to live a lot longer, who's going to see medical as longevity, right, as preventative and well care, and there's huge social implications in that. There's moral implications in that. There's security implications in that. And candidly, we need your help with that. So thank you for your time this morning. Hope you enjoy the conference.